Vă spun bun găsit, doamnelor și domnilor, cu ocazia sărbătorii Sfântului Ioan Botezătorul. Urăm tuturor românilor la mulți ani, multă sănătate și belșug. Astăzi ne aflăm în clinica medicală Aura Vita, alături de doamna doctor Florinela Bălan. Doamna doctor, am început un an nou 2017. Care sunt perspectivele acestui an? După cum știți, numerologic înseamnă 1. 2017 înseamnă cifra 1 adunat, adică noi începuturi. Și nu vorbim de anul acesta, noi vorbim de 9 ani de aici încolo, pentru că, de fapt, așa se calculează. Evoluăm la 9 ani, cu 9 ani, în grup de 9 ani. Și, de asemenea, trebuie să știți, din punct de vedere medical, acești ani vor fi ani energetici, vor fi ani holistici, vor fi ani când va fi descoperită energetic vindecarea cancerului și a bolilor cronice, a bolilor autoimune, de exemplu. Următorii ani vor fi ani despre dezvoltare spirituală și de vindecare energetică, precum și cultivarea stării de uh, armonie, a stării de echilibru energetic, numită stare de sănătate, adică normalitate. Cum se va face trecerea de la medicina obișnuită la medicina energetică? S-a făcut deja. Noi avem deja o mie de emisiuni de medicină holistică, de medicină energetică, de vindecarea bolilor cronice, a bolilor autoimune și avem și cazuri de cancere rezolvate. Ce credeți, dacă ar fi să trasăm calea către abordarea holistică, de unde am pleca? De la energie, bineînțeles. De la explica și de la a simți energia. Corpul energetic poate fi perceput, poate fi măsurat și poate fi armonizat atât prin reechilibrare, și noi o facem deja în această clinică la Raiocom, dar și prin practici energetice. De exemplu, Tai Chi și Qigong, de care am mai vorbit în alte emisiuni și o să vedem ce spune domnul doctor Roger Ianche în următorul filmuleț. While Qigong and Tai Chi are, in their native land, referred to in terms of Qi, in the Western or European world, we are oriented to explaining health and performance practices in terms of anatomical and physiological function. Human anatomy and physiology are commonly understood in contemporary science to be infused with functionality. That is the workings of the body at every level. However, in China, physical function is just one aspect of what the ancients called qi. In the Healer Within Medical Qigong program, you will hear and see references that are reflective of what qi is and how the qi could look or feel. For now, let's explore the anatomy and physiology of mind-body practices in Qigong and Tai Chi. How is functionality an equivalent of Qi triggered? How is it enhanced? How is it sustained? The skeletal system. According to the ancients who developed Qigong, The qi penetrates to the marrow of the bones to be stored as a resource for healing and empowerment. The bones support the whole body in navigating gravity and the marrow is the birthplace of the stem cells that differentiate into red and white blood cells. According to Qigong philosophy, the bones are also a key component of the qi matrix. Given bones are distributed in all parts of the body, their contribution to the overall function of qi is pervasive throughout the body. The muscular system. You may feel releasing, relaxing, or tingling throughout the tissues of your arms, legs, and torso. Quiet the mind. Feel the chi. Rather than think about what you should be feeling, notice what you are feeling. 
The muscles, like all collections of cells, are operational due to the presence of fuel for function. Functional capacity in the muscles is not just activated by intense effort. Function is also enhanced in the state of alert rest in Qigong and Tai Chi. The muscles are everywhere. Functional support is everywhere. Thus, the Qi is everywhere. The circulatory system. Chinese medicine suggests that the Qi and the blood function together like a brother and sister. Both deliver functional and healing resources to all the parts of the body. When it is said, feel the Qi, in part what you may be feeling is the activity of the blood. In a state of relaxed practice, the blood system expands, allowing for more oxygen and nutrition to support function in every cell. It is possible to feel this. It is subtle. Because the blood in the vessels and capillaries is functioning everywhere, awareness of the blood is inherently awareness of Qi. The lymphatic system and the body fluids. In Chinese medicine, all fluids other than blood are referenced as the fluids. Lymph, cerebrospinal fluid, synovial fluid in the joints, even tears. The lymphatic system is the foundation of the elimination of internal waste as well as the delivery system for the immune cells. Qi Gong and Tai Chi enhance the propulsion and function of all of the fluids. Be attentive to your practice. You may be able to feel subtle fluid-based sensations internally that are what the Chinese chose to call the Qi. The nervous system. The nervous system delivers impulses, signals that support and also can restrain or encumber physiological function. Neurons are everywhere throughout the body, delivering messages and information that direct function as well as supporting the creation of feelings and moods. Neurological impulses cooperate with cells, organs, glands, and overall chemistry to fulfill mind and body functions. Neurological impulses transport and transmit to all of the regions of the body and are very similar to Qi. When you feel the effect of soothing, harmonizing, and balancing the activity of the nervous system, you are feeling what the ancients called Qi. The organs, including the brain and spine. In all cultural systems, from the ancient shamanic to the present, the organs are a major focus of what we believe to be our functional capacity. And, in all systems of thought, the organs are responsible for the processes that sustain life. They are key locations for chemical interactivity and, in Chinese medicine, they are the focal areas for the interactivity of the Qi. In the most recent version of what is called the Qi channel system, there is an energy channel for each of the organs, each of the glands, and the brain and spine. Sensations of function in all of these are equivalent to Qi sensation. The systems we have discussed, bones, blood, fluids, nerves, all use, produce, and engage in interactions that are chemical in nature. Interestingly, 
One of the more contemporary definitions of qi is the interactions of the chemicals in any system. Nutrients, enzymes, hormones, neurotransmitters, and even more subtle cofactors, including components of the genetic material, are all constantly interacting and functioning. In your Qigong and Tai Chi, both as you practice and over time, breath, movement, mind focus, and self-applied massage all collaborate to enhance the efficiency of inner chemical activities. When you feel, is it chemistry or is it the Qi? The relaxation response. When we practice Qigong and Tai Chi, the integration of breath, body, mind, and massage all contribute to the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system's healing neurohormones and the inhibition of the sympathetic system's action hormones. In the stress response, inner function, including oxidation and inflammation, decrease well-being and can cause disease. The relaxation response, fostered by Qigong and Tai Chi, enhances the capacity of functional renewal and restoration, healing, at levels as obvious as feeling relaxed and well, and at much deeper levels in the shift of the neurotransmitter profile and even in the telomeres of the DNA. How amazing is all of this? These mind, body, and energetics practices developed so many millennia ago have influences on all the systems of the physical body. The totality of all physical function is very likely a direct equivalent of what the Chinese call qi. The function in these systems is pervasive everywhere throughout the body, just as the qi is everywhere throughout the body. Here is the most interesting part. While physical function is internal energy, qi is not. In a way, we appear to be separate physical units, person to person. However, the qi is internal and external. Maybe you have felt your own energy field, qi field. Is it possible that we are energetically connected with everyone and all things as a part of the totality sum of qi energy in the whole world? Are we even connected with the whole universe? In the Qigong view, the answer is yes. Doamna doctor, mintea umană poate înțelege greu că te miști într-un anumit fel și chiar fără efort și astfel poți regla energiile din corp, cum am văzut de altfel și în filmuleț. Da, asta dacă nu știm cum funcționăm. În schimb, dacă cunoaștem cum funcționează mintea umană și am avut filmulețe despre cum funcționează mintea, trebuie să știți că, apropo, mintea emite gânduri. Și gândurile ce sunt? Sunt niște frecvențe. Pentru că dacă vrem să investigăm, de exemplu, mintea umană, ne ducem la psihiatrie și acolo ni se face o electroencefalogramă. Adică, cum arată electroencefalograma? Ca niște vibrații, ca niște unde. Așa ni se dă, știți? De fapt, și la inimă, la cardiologie, dacă mergem și inima, tot așa funcționează pe niște frecvențe. 
Și să știți că și rinichiul funcționează pe frecvențe. Dar nu avem noi la ora asta o investigație care să măsoare rinichiul și să vedem frecvența lui, decât în medicina holistică. Cu alte cuvinte, dacă am cunoaște puterea minții și anume cum gândul sub formă de intenție, adică faptul că ne propunem ceva cu mintea noastră, e, de fapt este o forță această intenție uh, dirijată, este o forță care adună, care mobilizează, care mișcă energia. Deci, vizualizarea cu mintea, prin intenție, a meridianelor energetice, a energiei ci, de fapt, care circulă prin aceste meridiane, face posibilă această antrenare, această mișcare energetică în corp. Deci, putem să mișcăm energia cu mintea, prin intenție, dar numai în situația în care conștientizăm, adică dacă știm acest lucru și, știm, și exersăm, mai ales dacă exersăm, de exemplu, prin meditații repetate și prin conștientizări. Care este punctul de pornire pentru o astfel de abordare energetică? Cunoștințele de medicină cuantică și dacă urmărim întreaga istorie a fizicii cuantice, care a început să se dezvolte din 1900 încoace, de fapt a dus la acest moment actual la această evoluție pe care o are medicina prin medicina holistică. Vorbim de dualitatea luminii. Lumina însemnând de fapt informație. Lumina poate exista în două forme, și anume materie, și anume sub formă de atom, pe care o cunoaștem cu toții, sau unde? Frecvențe, adică vibrații. Dacă înțelegem aceste lucruri, putem înțelege că în corp sunt elemente de natură materială, fizic, direct, adică materie, adică organele pe care le știm. Și, dar și energii, energii, uh, impulsuri sub formă de unde, sub formă de vibrații, care ele, de fapt, curg noi sub forma acestui ci și ele atestă existența acestui corp energetic, acestui ci care curge în noi. Medicinii alopați se uită decât la materie, iar medicii holistici lucrează cu vibrații adică cu energie, dar și cu materia. De exemplu, noi lucrăm cu acupunctură lichidă, care reprezintă cocktailuri din plante. Ele lucrează, le dăm în bolile obișnuite, bol de rinic, bol de ficat, adică lucrăm în corpul fizic, dar lucrăm cu ele și în corpul energetic. Ele sunt foarte importante. De ce? Pentru că sunt în aceste combinații pe vibrația meridianelor și trebuie să știți că pe lângă faptul că fac detoxifiere în fizic, lucrează și o detoxifiere energetică, de exemplu emoțională sau de exemplu sufletească. The year was 1900. Max Planck had finally devised a means of solving a problem that had haunted him for the better part of a decade. What was the relationship between the intensity of a black body, like the sun, and the frequency of the light that it emitted? Though he had at last arrived at an answer, Planck was dissatisfied. His solution utilized the ideas of Ludwig Boltzmann, ideas so outrageous that almost nobody accepted them. But because no conventional attempt at a solution was forthcoming, Planck employed these highly unorthodox ideas out of desperation. Little did he know that in doing so, he had plunged headfirst into realms of physics hitherto unknown and untested. What he discovered would fundamentally change our understanding of nature. Forever. In order to begin to understand what motivated the development of quantum theory, one must first understand the status of physics at the end of the 19th century. At the time, there were three main branches of physics. First, there was mechanics, which was designed to predict the motions of masses, things that were influenced by gravity. Then there was thermodynamics, which was concerned with the relation of heat and temperature to energy and forces. Finally, there was electromagnetism, which dealt with interactions between charged particles. It is within the realm of electromagnetism that the story of quantum mechanics begins. In the early 1860s, James Clerk Maxwell had produced a set of equations that summarized electromagnetism. Before Maxwell, electricity and magnetism were considered two separate forces, but as the 19th century progressed, it steadily became more and more clear that these two interactions were fundamentally related. As it turned out, they were both the product of charge. Charge is an analog of mass. 
Like mass, charge is an inherent property of matter that is associated with a fundamental interaction. Mass produces gravitational fields, and these fields cause masses to attract to one another. Similarly, charge produces electric fields, which interact with other charges by causing them to either attract or repel. The concept of fields can be somewhat counterintuitive, so it might be helpful to think of them as odors. The closer you are to the source of an odor, the more strongly you'll feel its effects. If you dislike the odor, you'll tend to move away from the source, but if you find the odor attractive, you'll tend to come in closer. Electric fields work analogously. Opposite charges will be pulled toward each other because their fields, or odors, attract one another. Like charges will move away from each other because their fields repel them. When these charges begin to move, they generate magnetic fields, which further affect the motions of other charges. Additionally, it was discovered that not only do changing electric fields generate magnetic fields, but changing magnetic fields will also produce changing electric fields. Moving a charged particle will produce magnetic effects. Moving a magnet will generate electric voltage. Taken together, what this all suggests is that electricity and magnetism are different aspects of the same force. The theory of electromagnetism involved many difficult derivations and meticulous experiments, but when the dust finally settled, it became clear to all that not only are electric and magnetic phenomena fundamentally the same force, but that electric and magnetic fields could, together, produce a wave. A wave is a disturbance that travels through some material, called a medium. When this string experiences an impulse, a disturbance passes through it. The same general principle applies to sound waves, which in the common case are a disturbance passing through air molecules. Waves at the beach are also based on the same concept. Disturbances pass through the water, manifesting themselves in these familiar forms. What's crucial to recognize is that in each case, the medium itself, the string, the air molecules, the water, is not moving from one end to the other. They are simply being displaced by the energy that's passing through. So what happens when you take an electric charge and start to shake it back and forth, analogously to the way this boy is shaking the string? The electric field surrounding the charge will start to oscillate. As a result of this change in the electric field, an oscillating magnetic field will be generated, which in turn will create an oscillating electric field, and on and on it will go. The result is an electromagnetic wave. According to Maxwell's equations, the speed with which an electromagnetic wave travels is equal to the speed of light. This led him to conclude that light is a type of electromagnetic wave. As it turns out, there are many different types of electromagnetic waves. While they all fundamentally have the same structure, they differ in their wavelengths and frequencies. Wavelength is defined as the distance between successive crests in a wave. Frequency is defined as the number of complete wave sets to pass through a point per unit time. Generally, we measure frequencies in hertz, which is defined as the number of waves passing through a point per second. Since frequency and wavelength are inversely related, Electromagnetic waves with higher frequencies, like X-rays and gamma rays, will have shorter wavelengths. The contrapositive holds true as well. Longer wavelengths, like those of radio waves and microwaves, have lower frequencies. So at the end of the day, it was determined that light is just a disturbance of electric fields and magnetic fields. The wave picture of light was fully developed, and experiments had vindicated the notion that light was a wave. Interference. Diffraction. Dispersion. These behaviors are characteristic of waves and waves alone, and light exhibited each of them. Light was a wave, and that was the end of the story. Then along came Max Planck. In the final years of the 19th century, Planck was experimenting with blackbody radiation. All blackbodies, which are objects that perfectly emit and absorb electromagnetic radiation, release energy in the form of heat and light. Actually, most of the energy released by a blackbody takes the form of heat, and it was Planck's hope that by understanding the fundamental relationship between the intensities and the frequencies of the light that blackbodies emit, he would be able to develop a more efficient light bulb, one that maximized light output and minimized heat output. But there was a problem. The classical theory predicted that as higher frequencies of the emitted electromagnetic waves are considered, their intensities approach infinity, and the universe should be burning in an inconceivable blaze of blackbody radiation. This evidently wasn't happening, so obviously there was a problem. 
a problem that came to be known as the Ultraviolet Catastrophe. Though it was not Planck's mission to tackle this problem, he did end up resolving it by introducing an assumption that at the time seemed outrageous. In a private correspondence with his friend, Planck referred to the implementation of his assumption as an act of despair, and that he was willing to forego all of his previous conceptions about physics if it meant arriving at a correct solution. The assumption that Max Planck made was that energy, rather than coming in a continuous mesh of smooth values, came in discrete granular packets, which came to be known as quanta. Formally, the assumption that he made can be expressed with this equation. E equals NHF. Energy equals some integer, times some constant that would later come to be named after Planck, times the frequency of one of the standing electromagnetic waves inside of the black body cavity. A standing wave is what you get when two waves traveling in opposite directions interfere with one another and form a single wave whose peaks appear to move up and down. So what Planck specifically ended up assuming was that the energy spectrum of standing waves within a black body cavity was not continuous, as the classical way of thinking posited. Rather, there were specific values that the energies could take, and that any other values, including values between the allowed ones, were impossible. Put simply, here's what happened. Classical physics tells us that energy is like a ramp. To get from one end of the slope to the other, you can step on pretty much any part of the ramp. There are an infinite number of places you could occupy between the top and the bottom, and these points are all separated by infinitely small distances. What Planck assumed was that energy is like a staircase. You can stand here, 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 and here, but you cannot stand here or here. And the distance that separates each of these allowed energy levels is scaled by some factor of Planck's constant. The general principle that Planck had assumed, and applied to energy, is called quantization. Once Planck had made his assumption, he was able to derive an equation that accurately modeled the distribution of blackbody radiation intensity as a function of temperature and frequency. He had at long last found a solution to the problem that he'd labored over, and he eventually got a Nobel Prize for doing so. Planck then proceeded to measure his constant, which would go on to become the most important number in all of quantum physics. Putem înțelege, studiind fizica cuantică, că există o energie C care curge în noi și care este în strânsă legătură cu corpul energetic, cum spuneam. Dacă este așa, înseamnă că fiecare organ și fiecare glandă are un corespondent energetic. Și asta înseamnă, din punct de vedere medical, că șansele de vindecare se dublează. Dacă reglăm, dacă armonizăm și această parte energetică a organului, până acum nu știam de ea, dar să știți că fizica cuantică, medicina cuantică, deja o ia în calcul. <fie>